Very happy to be here. This is my second, uh, second visit to Montreal. And, um, given that I currently live in Ohio, it, for me it's always like, almost like visiting Europe here. Um, so uh, very happy about that. Very nice to be here. I'm going to, um, to pick up at, a, at, a play, at something which, uh, which Ian has, has mentioned. Um, namely on the nature of well, ontology modeling, uh, which is well primarily done using description logics or description logics at the core these days. And uh, Ian mentioned that the type of modeling done here is uh, something which, well, should not as much reflect the underlying organization of the data in the database, but should also connect to how humans, the human user, whatever user means in that context, uh, but how the user conceptualizes the domain. So um, this is what I'm going to talk about, about kind of challenges related to this. And reasoning, of course, comes into it as well in a certain sense because, yeah, we're using these logical formalisms. And um, what they're made for primarily is inferencing, of course. Um, and the underlying inference mechanisms actually explain the meaning, they give the semantics for these type of models. Before I go there, let me just uh, shamelessly do a little bit of advertising. Um, this is very new news uh, here. The Cementi Web Journal, which I co-founded uh, in 2010, uh, just got its first impact factor, and we're rather happy about it. Um, the journal was set up uh, with a non-standard review process. Um, submitted papers get put on the web immediately for possibly public review. We also have uh, solicited reviewers. Reviews are by default non-anonymous. And of course some people thought this is a crazy experiment when we did that. And uh, still our goal when we set this up was to essentially go to the, the top of the field, of the Semantic Web field in terms of journal. And uh, this year we suddenly got the, the stamp of approval that we're actually there. So we're, we're topping um, all journals which have actually web in their, in their name right now. If you look at other measures, and we know impact factors, I mean, it's just one of the measures. If you look at other measures, then, then uh, I, I'd say it's at least uh, uh, clear that we're on par with, with uh, the older journal in the field, uh, which we have one of the editors in chief, of course, in the room, uh, the journal Web Semantics. We have a kind of friendly rivalry between the journals going on. So. Um, but, but the kind of the two journals are there and the others come after this. So this is cool. Very happy about that. I have two, two, uh, two copies going around uh, the room right now. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention is a forthcoming book. I actually sent it to the publisher, the camera ready on Monday. This is a mock-up of the title. And I'm mentioning this uh, because most of the things I'm saying here come directly out of this book. Okay? Or some of the chapters there uh, which, which we contributed. So, okay, it's going to be about ontology modeling. So, let me go back to what I said earlier. Ontologies as, well, formal models for a domain. Um, well, if you talk about ontologies, then we probably also need to a little bit separate it from uh, kind of what's an ontology versus a knowledge base, right, in, in knowledge representation reasoning. And there's, there's different definitions around there um, which you can try to attempt. Um, I would kind of go with what I said earlier uh, as, as one of the things which are important, at least to me. An ontology is somewhere stuck between different things. On the one hand, it needs to connect to data and to databases. On the other hand, it needs to speak to the intuition of experts about a field. So human cognition comes into it. How do humans actually structure the information? And at the third time, it also needs to connect to potential applications and be useful for that as the piece which is in the middle of all those. Okay? Now, if you look at that, then uh, already here things become a little bit tricky. One of the original ideas of ontologies, uh, kind of 15 years old ideas of ontologies, was that you make an ontology which, which specifies, well, models a part of the domain of interest. Say, chess or oceanography or high energy physics uh, data coming from CERN, for example. Just some examples of, of data we've been working with. Um, and then the idea is that once you have done that, then others who would be having data on a same or overlapping domain, they could use your ontology and reuse it with their own data. 
Uh, reality is that this didn't work out. Um, well, for reasons which are up to debate still, I give you my reasons why, why this happened. I think one of the things is that in the early days when ontologies were kind of on the hype, on the buzzword hype, which was 10 years ago or so, or, or 12 or 14, um, people didn't quite know how to model ontologies. And uh, many of them were modeled very straightforwardly. Uh, I know some big ontologies and some application areas uh, back then which were actually modeled primarily by undergrads. Of course, that's tricky, right? So today we understand much more about it. However, that's the reality of many of the ontologies out there. And most ontologies I actually see and look into, um, I always get the feeling rather than reusing this ontology and adapting it for my purpose, it's probably less work to do it myself again from scratch. Not with all of them. Some are very well made uh, and they're very easy to reuse. So what exactly is it which makes an ontology reusable? Okay. Well, of course, if I have the exact same application context, then I can do that. Okay. Uh, however, that's not the idea behind the whole ontology thing. The idea is that, well, you may have a, a new application somewhere in the future, which you want to deal with. So let me look at um, an application scenario from, from one of our projects, which we do with primarily with ocean scientists. Um, and it is an application scenario from the context of the National Science Foundation EarthCube program, which is a 10-year program which has rather lofty goals, like um, developing a community-driven data and knowledge environment for the geosciences, um, which allow to integrate data management infrastructures across the geosciences. This is, this is huge, right? Across the geosciences, at least in, in North America. Um, so you have these scientists, you have these scientists working on whatever sat satellite data or on microbiopes in, in the ocean or others which work on, on, on kind of how water actually moves across the, the continent, uh, you, you name it all. Uh, others work on, on ecosystems, etc. And um, it turns out that they have data repositories. Well, some of these subfields have data repositories. They're pretty large. They have experimental data. Some, some of them are required by the National Science Foundation that if they uh, research on a certain area and get funding, then they have to put it into certain repositories. However, the Earth as a system uh, to answer the bigger questions, for example, around climate change, um, need to, well, for, for these, you need to be able to look at all this data in unison. You need to integrate all this data to get at the big research questions. So there is a, a, a pretty clear incentive here and also a very clear understanding among our scientists that this is so much needed. Okay? Tricky bit here is, of course, now talking about what's the application. Well, you can make some, like discovery of data which may be relevant for me, maybe one, right? But um, that's an easy one. The, the more tricky one is that, in particular, if you work with researchers, the exact questions which will be asked by people in two or three years, well, the interesting ones are probably not clear yet. So you want to organize, you want to model your data that it is kind of sustainable into the future. You have a sustainability problem uh, here as it pertains to data. So this is what we're looking into. Uh, what we do in, in one of the building blocks projects for EarthCube, the GeoLink project, um, where we primarily work with ocean scientists and, and some others, is um, we want to set up uh, both primarily for discovery, that's our primary goal, discovery of data relevant for whatever well new research question may come up, um, and do this in such a way that the approach which we use is extendable. So meaning new repositories can join as a, whenever they want uh, in the future without kind of us necessitating to change the way we organize our data. Um, and that we also can modify it towards kind of more fine-grained search if we want in the future. So if, if you look at these questions, then kind of how do you organize your data to do that? Well, at the same time, well, you can say to these very old repositories who come from their own field and have organized their data in a way which works for them and for their subfield, you can't come to them and say, well, you have to change how you do things. It's not going to work. Okay? It needs to be very decentralized. Okay. So, what I want to talk to you today about is 
uh, well, not exactly going through this use case, but I want to tell you a little bit about the ontology modeling principles, which we apply to try to get at a high quality model of a domain, which stands up to different perspectives, because this is what we need here. Okay? Um, every model of a domain has commitments, sometimes they're actually called ontological commitments, which, well, essentially say this is a particular point of view which one person or one group of experts or a subfield may have on the data. And the difficulty is always navigating these commitments because if you have too many of these commitments, then it's very difficult to reuse your ontology and your underlying data which comes with the ontology as a schema for a new purpose because your commitments may be too specific for a special application area. At the same time, if you have too few of these commitments, then your data becomes highly ambiguous and reuse is also difficult. Where is, this, is the soft spot in the middle? Right? And we don't have answers, we have hypotheses. And um, it's actually not easy to verify these hypotheses clearly because in order to do that, you would have to do a large scale project like we do in Geolink twice, right? Work a couple of years with this approach and with an older approach and then kind of compare which one was better. Uh, it's difficult to find funding for this type of long-scale uh, uh, comparison. Okay, so what are we doing? Um, uh, in this, and, and, and just to, to kind of highlight this again, down here we have different large-scale data repositories, for example. In here, and don't look at the details of this, I'll, I'll explain that at the very end um, uh, a bit more about this. We have our model, which is, should be such that we can tr faithfully um, map our different repositories into this and up, up on, on this, on this essentially interface, data interface, we build different applications. With the idea that, well, hopefully whatever new application may come out and may ha want to be built on top of this can actually be built without throwing away the type of modeling we've been done here. That would be the idea. Okay, and now I'm, I'm leaving the earth science uh, Realm. I just wanted to say, yeah, we're working with, with real data. Because in order to tell you some of the principles which we use for modeling, um, I think it's easier to actually look at a toy example. We use this toy example to actually generate data, uh, which we put out on the web. But it is nevertheless a toy example. But I think it, it serves very well. So we developed this example partly as a tutorial. Um, and uh, the sample domain which I want to look at um, well, um, I need some preparations. Later on, will be will be chess. But let me first, well, get you into some of the mood of the modeling and some of the things I'm going to discuss here, which are not about chess, will come up later again. We're talking about reuse of things. Okay. So, um, if you talk about data, then uh, uh, you've already seen on Ian's in Ian's talk that some of the data is organized in so-called, well, you could say in triples. Actually, some people in this area, in the Semeni web area, actually talk about triples as a technical notion. Triples consist of, well, something which is usually a, a URI. So it is web referenceable, right? I, I did not make kind of URIs here, but just think of Sesame Street as a URI, which stands for whatever, Sesame Street. You have a, a relation, like a has actor relation, the blank should, should be gone here. And you have another URI, uh, for example, Jim Henson, it could be X0123, whatever, right? I just call the URI something with Jim Henson because I actually mean it to stand for the puppeteer, Jim Henson, okay? Uh, and then you can you reuse this URI here, for example, and use another binary relation, like has name attaching a string to it, Jim Henson, which would be the name of that person, okay? So you have these type of triples, which, which correspond to base data. And if you have only such triples, then you can conceptualize these as graphs. Like, for example, the graph down here. Sesame Street has actor Jim Henson, has name Jim Henson as string. Okay? Um, now you may already say, well, isn't this a bit complicated? Can I just say Sesame Street has actor and then put the string Jim Henson there? Well, you can, of course. Right? Talk about ontological commitments. If you do that, what breaks down? Okay, well, this here is web referenceable. So say I have a different TV show like The Muppet Show, which has the same actor, also Jim Henson. 
then if I leave out the middle piece and only directly reference the string, then Muppet Show would also reference the same string. But, well, there may be more than one person called Jim Henson, so is it the same person or not? If I use this middle node, a referenceable URI, then I can relate both Sesame Street and Muppet Show to Jim Henson, and then I know, oh, it's actually the same thing. Okay, which happens to have the name Jim Henson. Talk about ontological commitments. Okay? This, one, this one is simple. Okay, let's talk about a few more of those. And now we're already getting into the modeling mood. Now let's, let's look at Muppet Show again. And now let's, let's say that somebody wants to reuse this type of organization, which you actually find, for example, on one of the, uh, one of the, the triple data stores RDF graphs which are out on the web uh, where somebody put used IMDB and, and put it out on the web um, as a graph so this is very much the structure you find there um, and let's say that we want to reuse this type of data organization okay? organization of the graph but we want to add some information about the character which is played by the person well it should be easy Right? I mean, you, you just add whatever, a new node somewhere, make new triples which say, okay, this is, this is the character play, like whatever, Kermit, for example. Okay? Um, however, if you look at this in a little bit more detail, then you notice that there is a problem. Okay? So we are reusing our Sesame Street as actor Jim Henson has named Jim Henson string. We have our Muppet show having actor Jim Henson has named Jim Henson string. And then we say, well, Jim Henson plays Kermit, Jim Henson plays Ernie. And then you may notice there's a problem. So suddenly, we want to repurpose this in a kind of rather harmless way, it seems. And already things break down. We can't do it like this. Because, well, OK, so while it is the case that Kermit appears both in Muppet show and in Sesame Street, Ernie doesn't. Okay? I've never seen Ernie on the Muppet show. I think he's not there. Okay? So something's wrong here with this way of organizing the graph if you want to reuse it and repurpose it. Okay? Now, uh, for people who do ontology modeling, uh, this, is, this is kind of a beginner's mistake which has been done. Okay? And uh, the beginner's mistake is that uh, Jim Henson is not always an actor. Jim Henson is a person who sometimes assumes the role of an actor. So this is the conceptual mistake which has been done here. Now we're talking about cognition. Okay? Um, so something's wrong with saying Muppet Show has actor Jim Henson. Jim Henson is a role which Jim Henson sometimes has. Now if you use this inside, okay, and kind of the check for this is, is the kind of talking about the, the temporal extents here. Yeah? Jim Henson is always a person. But Jim Henson is not always an actor. So there is the kind of conceptual break. Then you get this type of organization. And while it looks horrible in the beginning, right, it will soon become much clearer. Uh, Muppet Show has actor. Here's a role. It's the Jim Henson um, Muppet Show role where he plays Kermit. It's performed by Jim Henson, has name, well, string Jim Henson. Uh, Sesame Street has actor. Again, that's a role. It's the Jim Henson Sesame Street Kermit role. While down here is the Jim Henson Sesame Street Ernie role. Okay? Uh, plays Ernie, plays Kermit, both performed by Jim Henson, which has name string Jim Henson. Okay? Um, and now I say, well, this is getting complicated. Yeah, it's getting complicated. I'll address that at the very end. Because there is, of course, a problem with this complication as well. One well, of the problems with this complication is, well, you have to kind of understand uh, these things. So anyway, schematically, up here, and now I used movie, I should have used TV show. Um, up here, schematically, we had movie has actor person. I used to change the color. This is now a typing, OK? Typed, type movie, type person. Again, these types, which are called uh, classes or concepts, depending on whether you talk description logics or OWL, they're also given as web referenceable entities, as URIs. Okay? But essentially, it's, it's a typing uh, of the graph. Movie has actor person, in terms of types, has name, and this is a data type uh, instance, Jim Henson. This would be the first uh, example, and this down here would be how you would actually kind of rather do it. Okay? Like, Movie has actor, and here's an actor role playing a character. Okay? 
uh, performed by a person having a name. And, and if you do it like this, then suddenly other things also become easier. Like for example, the actor who is playing a certain character for a certain show may actually change after some time, right? Uh, up here, well, you're not entirely sure yet where you would attach the temporal information. You can't attach, well, you can probably attach it to the movie, it doesn't sound conceptually right. You can't attach it to the person. Um, but here it's clear because it's a role which is only assumed during a certain time span, for example, or in certain contexts, and all this contextual information can be attached down here. So this is a much more stable way of, of uh, well, schematically describing this type of relationships. It's much more reusable for different uses, for different contexts, and this is what we're driving at. Okay? Now, in fact, what we have here is a particular instance of something which some people in, in ontology modeling call the agent role pattern. Uh, which kind of, one way of looking at it is like this. Okay? There's something which provides a role Okay? The role is performed by an agent, and yeah, you have temporal information attached to it. You may have other information attached to it as well, but the temporal information kind of conceptually seems to be the distinguishing thing. Okay? Now, the, the thing here can be whatever, right? The agent, well, okay, sometimes agents are organizations. Okay? Uh, musical groups may be performing a certain role, okay? Uh, for example, in a movie or at a concert whatever, have different ones. Um, and this general pattern, which we call the agent role pattern, well, it looks like a pattern which can be reused in many contexts for many different things, but it looks like something very universal. Okay? Talk about reuse of ontological structures, and also talk about reusing this type of pattern in your ontology such that others can more easily reuse your ontology for a new purpose or the underlying data for a new purpose, namely integrating it with additional data. Say, one database gives you the people and uh, the actors and in which movie they play and another database might tell you the characters and you want to integrate those two. So we've come to the notion of pattern. An ontology design pattern, the notion was invented by, uh, by Aldo Gangemi and, and, and Eva Blomquist uh, about 2005, independently of each other, in fact, uh, in the same year. Um, and it, of course, it, is, uh, it takes inspiration from software engineering patterns, which in turn actually take inspiration from architectural patterns, so in, in building architecture. Um, and onto an ontology design patterns, in Aldo's definition, is a reusable successful solution to a recurrent ontology modeling problem. So one idea here is, you have some these patterns and then you can plug them together, well, to make hopefully most of your ontology. And if these patterns are well thought out, then things should kind of work out pretty easily that way. This is one of the ideas, helping ontology reuse. And of course, what I've shown you is only a graphical depiction of the pattern. What the pattern actually is, it's a kind of mini ontology specified in, well, description logics in the web ontology language. So it comes with an axiomatization. The axiomatization, which, which is expressed using a formal logic, usually description logic, sorry for the, for the non-introduced syntax here, I'll explain a little bit. It's, it's just a, a, a neat syntax, but it's trans translatable into first-order predicate logic. It explains in unambiguous terms some of the constraints on this type of model, which we just depicted in the graph. So let me go through some of those. So for example, the first one says that the range of provides agent role is always an agent role. So whenever something is attached as the second argument to this binary predicate, this thing as a second argument is an agent role. Well, it kind of makes sense if the relationship is called provides agent role. Okay. Another one would be this here. If you have an agent role, um, then, uh, well, if this agent role is performed by something, then this something is always an agent. Well, also makes sense, okay? Um, if something is performed by an agent, then this something is actually an agent role. Okay? Now, here things are kind of, now we're, now we're making a commitment. Now we're making a commitment. That is quite a commitment. Okay? So we're now 
defining what performed by means. And we have a very specific idea what it means. Namely, it's only the thing which relates agent roles and agents. You can think of other performances, right? But now we're saying no in our context. And hopefully the full URI of this would, would contain some information that it belongs to the agent role pattern. And then we can make this commitment and so on. Okay, and there's others like there's only one starting time for an agent role, only one ending time, etc. Uh, agents, agent roles, and time instance are disjoint classes, etc. But this axiomatization kind of explains, it constrains the interp interpretations which you can have uh, about your little pattern. Let me give you another pattern, and then we, we go into our chess modeling example. Um, this here would be a, a very minimal pattern for events in general. Um, there's actually some ontologies out there which are rather nice, which are much more complicated, but we had a need for something very, very simple. What is an event? And then you can kind of start your philosophical discussions about what is an event. If you take only the very, the most necessary commitments, okay, what are the things which an event always has, no matter what event you're talking about. Okay? And uh, you probably find, well, not, not that many, not that much. Okay? But perhaps unambiguous is that an event has always a spatial temporal extent. An event always happens at a certain, well, time and place. Although the, the place, the location may be, you know, an extensive location, but it has a time and place. The place may be abstract. It may happen in second life, okay? Which is kind of a little bit of a twist on spatial extent. Uh, but still, an event is somewhere and some when. Otherwise, you don't call it an event. And of course, there's, there's participants in an event. And now we come back, right? Our agent role comes back in. We haven't modeled spatial temporal extent. We're not going to do this here. Okay? Uh, there's some good suggestions for this as well. And you may have sub-events of events. That's also kind of in the nature of events that they often naturally fall into sub-events as well. There's other things you could add. Of course, right? You can extend the model, but, but these things seem to be, seem to be very central. Um, if you look at FrameNet, for example, uh, which is a linguistic resource, uh, then if you look at the definition of event there, then it primarily talks about time and space. Right? Okay, and again, we can make an axiomatization for this, um, which essentially uh, um, serves to, to kind of explain the meaning of the relationships of our, of our different pieces of the vocabulary. So very simple here. Um, let's go to a work example. How, how do we do modeling when we do modeling? And I have to say, I really enjoy this. Kind of sitting together with um, whatever a dozen or half a dozen of people who are uh, a mix of some, some people running repositories, others being domain experts. Um, in particular, if it's an area I have no clue about, like oceanography or high energy physics, for example. Uh, uh, and then you have different experts in the room. Particularly, it's, it's interesting if they disagree on some key notions which they have because you want to be kind of capturing different perspectives. So you want to make a model which actually stands up to the, to the different experts' opinions. Uh, and that can be rather fun. But I'm going to do a more simple example because we, we don't have the time to do something more complicated. And the simple example will be chess. Okay? I, I, I naively assume that... Every, Everybody has at least a very vague idea what, what, how the game of chess is played, uh, which I guess is a safe assumption. Okay. So, our goal would be establish a searchable repository for chess data. Um, our starting point are PGN files, which is a kind of semi-standardized format for chess notation based on, well, just text, um, uh, which uh, is used essentially by all websites and, and engines and chess engines uh, for sharing games and notation and a little bit of metadata about those. But of course the idea is that we want, the inf we want not only want to capture what's in PGN files because there are some things that are not in PGN files. Like for example, in PGN files the players are only given as strings and we've discussed already that this is, this is insufficient, right? And we may want to attach additional information about the players which you may get from websites like whatever, uh, people who were world champions for example or information about the tournaments and where they were held and etc. Uh, so we want it extendable in that way. So we do not want to only take what's in the data, we want to kind of lift it up to a conceptual level which allows for this type of integration. Okay, so our task here now, our little example will be about how do we get at making such an ontology. We have a pretty 
kind of standardized workflow in the meantime how we do this with, with different groups. So I want to run you through this very, very quickly. Um, ideally, if we do something like this, we have a, a, a group of people, say six to eight is a very good number, um, which needs to have diverse uh, expertise. So we need, we need more than one domain expert because we want a difference in opinion. Uh, we need people who understand the base data, in this case the PGN files or others, whatever Wikipedia sites, chess websites. Um, people understanding possible target use cases, okay, which may be domain scientists in this case. We, you need an ontology engineer familiar with the modeling approach and, and probably somebody who really understands the formal semantics. This is kind of a team which you need for this. Um, and then you start by querying the domain experts for the main notions of the application domain. What are your key notions? If you talk with oceanographers, one thing that comes up very easily is the notion of oceanographic cruise. Kind of it, it sometimes seems their lives center around cruises and going on cruises and collecting data there. Um, in chess, um, the examples would, would probably be things like chess game, move, opening, tournament, players, commentary, okay, something like that. So you get a list of these. And then as the next step, you look at what we call competency questions, meaning you make a list of example questions which kind of mirror what you would like to be able to get answered from your knowledge base uh, once it would be fully established. Like for example, who played Kasparov in the round 1994 Linearis tournament uh, as white or black? Um, Find all games in which Bobby Fischer playing Black Lost in the Poison Pawn variation of the Sicilian defense. Uh, are there any recorded games using the Grunfeld defense from before the 20th century, etc. Okay, wh whatever people, geeks and non-geeks may be interested in, in answering. Okay, next step. You prioritize your notions. Uh, this is of course just a kind of gut feeling which, which may be the more central notions to go with. Probably starting with chess game may be a good idea. Talking about moves and about players, something like this. And then you sit back a little bit and think about the nature of the things you've just been, uh, you've just been written up. What actually is a chess game? So the idea of this is that you may want to borrow from a pattern which some people have already modeled because some people put thought into this pattern and if you reuse that and are able to reuse that, you're more likely not to make any silly beginner mistakes when doing that. And then, yeah, what is a chess game? I mean, you could probably model a chess game as, um, as a, an artistic artifact. There's some point to that. Okay? That is not wrong. That's okay. However, if we look at the competency questions, which we just listed, where you would ask things like, um, uh, find all games in which Baby Fisher uh, lost in the Poison Pawn, or um, what did Kasparov say about his opponent's first two moves? Um, or um, uh, did Bobby Fischer ever play against the Grandmaster in Germany? Then you think, well, okay, these, these, they don't think, seem to fit with a chess game as an as a artistic artifact. That, that would be a bit of a stretch. It's probably not the perspective which fits our, our use case. The perspective which fits our use case because actually we talk here about times we talk about places, we talk about players, and then the idea may pop up, yeah, a chess game is an event. It's an event. We talked about events earlier, right? So you have spatial temporal extent, you have uh, participants in the event, so that is probably a good way to go. Once you do that, things become a little bit easier. A half move, I have to explain, right? Most people call it a move kind of people who know about chess call it a half move. It's when one player moves a piece. Chess people call this a half move. And kind of two, two half moves together make a move. It's kind of weird, but that's how they call it. What is a half move? Well, once you decided that chess game is an event, then it's clear that half move is, is a sub-event. Okay, so this already falls in place. Player, well, white player, black player, and again, things almost fall into place because player is the role of an agent. So we have our agent role. What else could it be uh, once we define it? Tournaments are, of course, events, openings and commentaries. Well, he here things may become a little bit more tricky. So we let's probably delay this for a bit. Let's delay this for a bit. Let's start with the, with the more easy stuff up there. And now you may already notice that while we talked about events, we talked about agent roles, and we know how they connect. So at this point, making the model becomes almost canonical. 
So this is our generic agent role pattern. And down here, we take the specific specialization of this pattern, which pertains to our chess games. <laughs> Here's chess game, uh, provides the agent, ro agent roles. There's two sub-concepts of this particular agent role, which are relevant for us, namely black player and white player, performed by agent. There may be more, of course. That's not a problem. There may be a referee, for example, right? Or a spectator, or... Uh, or a, uh, an adjunct to one of the players, for example, well then we can, of course, add more agent rules by just making more subclasses later, but this seems to be pretty stable uh, in the moment, okay? Um, so yeah, specialization of our agent role, specialization of our event. Um, I've actually, and I decided not to correct this. When we did the chess game, um, we were often thinking of events as having a time and having a place. And th the more we kind of model, the more we found, now oh, we can't do that. Events don't have time and place. Events have a spatial temporal extent. Conceptually speaking, they have a spatial temporal extent. Because many events move around. And it was kind of stuck in our face when we talked with these oceanographers and modeled an oceanographic cruise as an event. Because, of course, it has a trajectory. Right? It doesn't have a time and a place. It has something which moves or meanders, uh, etc. So uh, this is an ontological commitment which naively seems to work. But once you start thinking about it, you notice that when you want to integrate data, it actually breaks down. Okay? So I have to say, when we modeled this, we made a mistake. Okay? Well, of course. Or it rather, is it a mistake? It limits the scope. For example, it means that we are not able to use this to reasonably model, um, I think it was, was it 1990? One of the World Chess Championships actually took place in two sessions, one I believe in Paris, the other in New York or something like this. I don't recall where they were. Uh, so it moved. Anyway, let's go with this simple model for the time being. I decided to not change the example to point out kind of things that happen when you make an ontological commitment which is overly strong, like the assumption that you can separate time and place. Um, however, if you do this, then now you can specialize this again to our chess game. Okay? Chess game at time and place, or rather think of it with a spatial temporal extent, provides agent role performed by agent. Okay, and we talked about the roles which are relevant for us earlier, so this part is already one we actually looked at. Um, half moves. Half moves are sub-events of chess games. Uh, so again, we model it on the event. Well, we don't have to talk about time and place here. We could, but kind of, well, sometimes if you record the times of moves as well, you can. Uh, but let's leave this out for the moment because we know we can always add that here if we want some time clock, etc. Half move sub-event of chess game. This is a, a, just a standardized notation for recording a half move. Um, provides agent role. The role here is now the acting player role performed by an agent. Okay? Falls into place very canonical from our considerations reusing the patterns. Okay. Before we put them together, let's talk about openings, game results, etc. And now I'm, I'm introducing to you a, another pattern, which is actually, we call it a meta pattern. Um, and that is kind of a placeholder for things we may want to model later. So opening, a chess opening is a very, very complex notion. It's a very complex notion. If you play chess, you know that. There's a lot of data about this, etc. Not only what the actual opening is, but who has invented it, who has made which, which, uh, which improvements at which time, during which time they were popular, all these kind of things. Okay? Very, very complex notion. Uh, do we want to model this right now? Well, we could, right? But when we did this, you always have to stop at some stage. And here we said, well, no, we don't want to do that because this information is not in the PGN file, so we do not want to do this right now, but we want it extendable later. So what do we do in that case? We make a so-called stop. We call this a stop. There is a placeholder for chess opening, which we can expand later to add more information about it or more structure to it. And then we just give it something very simple, like a name and an echo code. Echo is the encyclopedia of chess openings, which is information, both of which you may find in a PGN file. So right now, we're simply attaching the ECO code or the name, like Sicilian Defense, 
via this intermediate node to chess game. And this intermediate node is important, of course. <coughs> For the same reason we had earlier um, with, with giving uh, the actor just as a string. Okay? So this is one reason. We want to have something which kind of is a, a referenceable URI and not only a string which is a name. And at the same time we also have a hook to which we would be able to attach additional information about openings, like who invented it, etc. We can attach this here. Uh, we cannot really attach it to a string, for example. So this is what we call a stub. And for our time being, we just make stubs for chess opening, chess tournament, and chess game results. Chess game result is not quite as simple as you may think, because it's not only who wins and who loses, or was it a draw. But for example, um, you may want to know whether there were any World Championship games which were actually won by forfeit because one of the players didn't show up, for example. Was it won by time control, or etc. So it may also be potentially a complex entity, and again we just make a stub uh, and kind of kick it down the road without breaking things by oversimplifying. Okay, and now let's put things together. And this diagram here is really just putting the things together which I mentioned earlier. So here's the chess game. Okay? Uh, we know it's a subclass of event. Okay? Um, you, chess tournaments, well, chess games are sub-events of chess tournaments. Chess tournament is a subclass of events, seems kind of clear enough. Um, half moves are sub-events of chess games, and then we want to add a few more additional things which kind of people who know about kind of using this type of data would know like it's really helpful if you make an additional pointer to the first and the last move for example. We want the next half move pointer here again because it also kind of helps you dealing with the data later. Um, but these are kind of conceptually simple uh, to deal with. Then we have agent roles like for example down here we have the black player and the white player agent role down here we have the acting player role I made it two different agent role things here because it kind of separates things in the diagram more easily although of course it would be the same URI if you do that and we have our stops attached over there so it becomes relatively canonical to do this here. Um, one thing I haven't talked about yet was commentaries and then kind of now we look at it, what, what would commentaries be in this context? A commentary on a chess game. Um, and again, there's different ways how to do this, but conceptually it seems kind of reasonable that if we talk about, about an event, then we may talk about reports on these events, which can come in different forms. Could be news, but could also be a game score, okay, which is essentially a report on the event. So we add chess game reports, which of course, um, provide roles, namely, for example, the author role, and then we have pointers to where it originates from, which may be a PGN file, and it actually may contain annotations, meaning comments, to the half moves, which is the way how commentaries are usually done uh, in the context of chess. Okay. Um, add a question check. I need to check the time. Um, so whatever, 15 more minutes or something like that? Five, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, okay, that's fine then, okay. Okay, once we have the model, what do we do? We, we uh, look at sample data, can we actually populate the ontology? Are there things which we need to change? We check if competency questions can be answered. Did we kind of cover all relevant corners? Uh, at axioms as appropriate, most of them in this case would be inherited from the patterns which we have, but there may be some more more interesting ones. Um, notice that the graph is only for intuition. The graph is extremely helpful for modeling with the domain experts, but it's the ontology engineers which need to keep track of what the things actually mean and put them into logical axioms. Um, and these are often post hoc details which can be taken care of. Um, by the modelers. Let's talk about axioms just for a minute because this is about reasoning. Uh, they're of course inherited from agent, from event and agent role in this case, so from the patterns which we reused um, and uh, uh, kind of the types which I discussed earlier. But let, let's just say kind of there, there may be some things which may be a little bit more interesting. Um, we sometimes have discussions about this type of axiom. What does this say? This says that a chess game is sub-event of zero or more chess tournaments. Does this make sense? 
Okay, now you can ask, does this make sense? Yeah? Logically speaking, in terms of a logical axiom, it is a tautology. If you take this as a logical axiom, then it doesn't say anything because, yeah, of course, a chess game is always sub-event of zero or more chess tournaments because there's the zero there. So what's the point? Okay? You can't do reasoning with this. However, reuse of an ontology also critically depends on humans who want to possibly reuse the ontology, understanding the intention of the modeler. And for this purpose, this axiom is extremely helpful because it indicates that there is a possible connection between chess games and chess tournaments, which is mediated by this sub-event relationship. So it says a chess game may be a sub-event of a chess tournament, but it doesn't have to be. Okay? For the human, that's helpful. Biologically, it's a tautology. Interestingly, we can express this using our formal logic. Okay, whether or not, well, this is something you really want to do, um, I don't have a definite answer to. Okay, so now one thing we find is when we make these models is that, uh, well, if we now make these models which are kind of relatively extensive, okay, um, and we, we throw this at people who actually know about the data and know about the domain, then um, we sometimes get feedback like, wow, this is complicated. Okay? Uh, in my database, I don't have agent roles, right, for example. Um, so this kind of, I, in, in my database, I don't have kind of an extra kind of node for chess game report, things like this. This is overly complicated. Now, of course, you can take the position, well, if you want to have something which stands up to multiple perspectives, where you can integrate data, which doesn't break later, then you just have to go there with the complicated way. However, you can also try to reach out and kind of meet them halfway without, leaving, without losing what you have achieved. And this is actually an idea which was, which was relatively new for us. Uh, we came up about a year ago or two. And that is the idea of, well, shortcuts. Well, some other people have talked about this before as well. So, but for us, it was a new idea. What is a shortcut? Well, a shortcut, the, if we depict it, then a shortcut is, well, really just a shortcut through the model. Like here from chess game, directly to the string, which indicates the player. And let's talk this, call this a binary relationship, has white player or has black player. We already know we shouldn't model it like this, um, you know, in our, re in our model for integration. Because if we do that, then, well, we may have a problem with players who have the same name and we can't really say kind of when this is the same player and when it isn't. So this is not something we want to use for modeling if we look at integration. But doing it like this may make it much easier for somebody who actually works with the data to just kind of push it out into our graph format. Okay? Um, so what we actually want to do is we want to give to this person who probably only has strings. Right? So that person has the problem of not knowing whether two toast Joe Smiths are actually the same Joe Smiths. But well, it's just not in his data. Yeah? Uh, but in any case, he can provide us with this. And then we can kind of hopefully take care of trying to figure out which two John Smiths are actually the same ones. Okay, it's called co-reference resolution, known problem in ontology engineering. But we want to make it easier for the person providing the data to give us the data in this graph form such that we can start populating our more complex model. So what we want is... Um, we want to have mappings which go in both directions, namely from our more complex model to the, to the simplified model which uses only the shortcut and also the other way around. Uh, one direction is easy. From the complex to the simple is easy. Okay? That's just done by these two, ro two rules here, for example. Uh, uh, essentially, if you kind of go this route, then this uh, generates uh, a route, the, the red route. The other direction is more interesting. And this is a point I wanted to make, as long as Ian is in the room anyway. Um, the, other, the other direction is more interesting. Um, oh, sorry, this, this I didn't want to. The other direction is, where is it? Where is it? Uh, it's here. The other direction is more interesting. So what we want to do is we want to give, um, we want to give the person providing the data the possibility of giving us the red one, and then we want to populate the more complex model. Regretfully, if you want to do that, 
This is a relationship which we cannot express current standardized languages from the semantic web domain. We cannot do this in the web ontology language, for example. Um, we can do it with so-called existential rules, okay? uh, because somehow you need to say, well, if you map in a different direction, there has to be a node here and there has to be a node here. You kind of need to create them um, and then kind of map it to the more extensive model. But it's not only ex getting them into existence, you may also give them some names. So you may want to do this mapping while minting names for this. And uh, it turns out that even something like Sparkle, if you can heard about here, if you heard about it, cannot really do that. Sparkle construct comes very close, but this URI minting doesn't work. So there is a gap, at least for us, in this time of in this kind of uh, <coughs> mapping between the extensive model. And the simplified model, which uses only the red relationships, this here would be a picture of only the simple model, which somebody could much more easily populate with data, and which we then can lift to a more complex one to integrate it with other information. OK. Um, so to wrap up, <coughs> what we did in our GeoLink project, and it's not ended yet. We have the model. Uh, we have started to map out data. Um, our next steps, which will be in the, next following, in the following months, will be to a, finish a demonstrator and then at the same time also um, look at what we can do with reasoning in the background. We think what we can do with that is uh, find problems in the data, for example, enhance data with additional information, etc. Uh, but primarily, right now, what we have is we have our complex model, which is actually well built from these pieces, patterns or modules, as we sometimes also call them linked together. Uh, and this is a high level perspective of the ontology which we have made and each of the green ones here <coughs> actually stands for a little module which is informed by the modeling approach which I just told you. So what we also get by doing this is we get this big ontology is broken down very neatly, very naturally in different conceptual pieces which speak to the domain experts. Right? Oceanographers, they talk about cruises, they talk about physical samples, um, they talk about digital objects, they talk about funding awards, and these are some of their central notions which they have. There should be vessels somewhere, oh no, it's probably part of the cruise. Um, one minute looking at cruise, okay, cruise as one of the modules which we used. The main node is here. Um, it provides agent roles, for example, of course. I mean, there will be a captain, there will be a, a principal investigator, uh, there will be other participants which have different roles related to the cruise. And then uh, one of the central pieces of cruise is not the full model, it's only part of it, is that a cruise has a trajectory. Okay? And in order to model the trajectory, I'm not going through the whole model, we were actually also able to reuse a pattern which had been developed independent of this use case for modeling trajectories as ontologies. So again, same thing. Some people had put work and thought into how would you do that. And it turned out it just completely worked for our use case. It was a minor adaptation, like for example, adding ports to the points on the trajectory, which we actually know which are, which are fixes. Okay, so that's, that's the modeling approach. There is a preliminary demo of some of the data. You can browse through the data at demo.geolink.org if you like, if it's currently up. So this is still being worked on. So if you all go there right now, it may probably crash. But it should be more stable uh, sometime soon. Okay, so wrapping up. Uh, as was already mentioned by, by Ian, the web ontology language um, is one of the, the standards uh, recommended by the World Wide Web Consortium for expressing ontologies and sharing them on the web. Most of the things I've shown you here are completely expressible in this web ontology language apart from these, these links. Okay? We, we, ever so often we come about things which are, which are not quite doable there. And this is very interesting because it gives research questions which are more on the logical, theoretical side. Um, there is another World Wide Web Consortium standard, the Resource Description Framework, RDF. Um, this is essentially, you can think of this as a very, very crude simplification. But I think of RDF as the language for expressing the data graph, while OWL is the language for expressing the schema graph, or the, the typing of the graph with the type logic. So these are two of the central standards. And then there is a query language which goes with those, which is called Sparkle. Uh, and there is a references list 
uh, which you can look at for pointers. And I stop it here. Thank you very much.